Hi, it's Jan Beta, and some of you might have noticed that I had to take down the video that I already released this week because, yeah, I was a bit premature there and the device I have shown in the video is not announced yet and the official release is going to be in a couple of days and I am going to re-release the video when the time comes, but I have to fill the gap and the whole process left me a bit upset and I hope nobody is really angry at me or at any of the parties involved. I apologize. And yeah, I basically have to come up with a new video for this week very quickly. And as I'm upset and I'm always uh, looking forward to repairing C64s and that always kind of soothes my nerves, I'm just going to try to do another C64 repair video. Hopefully this is going to go well, otherwise I don't know where my brain is going to take me. But we're going to see. We're looking at this Commodore 64 assembly number 250407 board that got donated by Marek from the Czech Republic. Thank you so much for that. He only needed the SID chip out of this and he also needed the case. That's why it's only a bare board at the moment. It does kind of power up. I already hooked it up here and tried it out. However, it shows a scrambled, like, garbage character screen. Let's have a look at that. Speaking of PCBs, let's take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs, as you probably know. They offer very high quality circuit boards that they make from the Gerber files you send them. Their website is pretty easy to navigate and you can easily just upload your files and they offer excellent quality and they also have very fast delivery times and quick turnaround. So I highly recommend checking out PCB Way. The link is in the video description. Let's get back to the C64. Yeah, and as you can see, we have a classic garbage screen, some different colors there. This can hint to a lot of things, some of the logic chips or the RAM. I'm just glad it isn't another blank screen Commodore 64, which is apparently the most common fault in these Commodore 64s, because nearly every single IC on the board can cause a blank screen to happen for the C64. So this is hopefully going to be a bit easier to troubleshoot than the stubborn C64 that I had previously. Yeah, we're going to see about that. Let's hope for the best. Upon closer inspection of the board, I can see right away that this has the MT RAM chips in here. Mostly seven of the eight RAM chips are MT. One already got replaced. These are very common parts to fail, so I highly suspect these. However, there's also MOS logic chips in here. So these are uh, 7711, 7712 and 7708 logic chips. There's also 7707 on this board. These are MOS made logic chips. They made these whenever they couldn't get uh, logic chips from other manufacturers. When they were low on stock, they just uh, quickly whipped these out in their own IC manufacturing facilities. MOS was part of Commodore at this point. And basically these are very low quality parts. Even MOS engineers uh, are saying that in, in retrospect. These are just dirt cheap replacements that they used whenever they didn't have any stock of other 74 logic chips. These are MOS replacements for regular 74 logic chips. One of them already has been replaced with this uh, marked chip. And I'm probably going to test this as well, because I'm not too sure why it is uh, marked with a yellow marker there. Maybe it's a broken chip as well. So I think our problem is related to one of the logic chips or one of the RAM chips. But uh, first things first, we are going to take a look at the voltages that actually arrive at the board. So what I usually do for testing the voltages, the first thing I want to test are the voltages coming from the power supply. On the user port you have these slots and the pins next to this slot should be our 5 volts DC. That's the voltage coming directly from the power supply and it's 5.1, that's perfectly fine. And on the other slot here, we should have our AC voltage, which should be around 9 volts or a bit higher. And it's 10 volts, which is perfectly fine. And also on the board are these two voltage regulators, which are a 7805 
and a 7812 providing the cleaner voltages for the VIC-2 chip, which is the graphics chip and the SID chip, which isn't present on this board, uh, just to minimize interference and noise on the signal. So we should have, this should be ground, this should be grounded, so we should have a clean 5 volts here on the rightmost pin of this one and we should have 12 volts here. Yep, that's all good. One thing I always try is to power cycle this for a couple of times and see if our output changes. And as you can see now we got a black screen, for example, and we get a slightly different pattern here. Yeah, that looks pretty much the same, but still slightly different. The fact that we get sometimes get a blank screen, which locks into the signal, uh, it already tells me that the VIC-2 chip in this one is probably all right because the output looks uh, good. Other than that, it's not the regular startup picture. I think the processor could also be okay. These uh, garbage screens can also be caused by the processor. As there are so many MOS logic chips on the board, I think I might want to look at those first. The very first thing I'm going to do is to insert my dead test cartridge here to see what that gives me. The output should be at least some flashing signal if we have a problem with the RAM, which also includes these uh, logic chips actually, especially these 7708 multiplexers. Um, they are MOS versions of 74LS257 chips and I think, yeah, these are very suspect, especially if you have changing behavior with, with every power on and are suspecting some kind of RAM issue. These are the first things I usually suspect. Engage dead test. Oh, that's seven flashes. Uh, let me just see if this does the same fault for every power up. That's eight flashes. <laughs> yeah, if that happens, my first suspect would be the multiplexer chips, really. Yeah, we have kind of different behavior for each power on. The MT RAM chips, as I've pointed out in an earlier video, are a very common point of failure, but also these MOS chips. Usually what I do is to just replace them right away without even looking any further, because these chips fail so commonly that they are... Yeah, it's easier to just replace all of them right away probably than to look any further into this. So yeah, I'm probably going to end up doing that at some point, but for now I just want to see if we can pinpoint the fault. Might even be multiple faults, of course, with uh, a number of those chips in there. None of the RAM chips gets hot, really, so that's a good sign, at least. No shorted RAM, probably. Sometimes they get hot, sometimes they don't. It's always a good idea to have a little feel around on the board. <laughs> and in this case, it seems like they're not None of them gets really warmer than the others. I think the very first thing I want to try is to test this logic chip that already has been replaced, just to make sure it's a good one. Because if that one is good, we are pretty sure that it's one of the soldered in chips that is wonky. So I placed the logic chip in question in my Mini Pro TL866 EEPROM programmer, which actually can test logic ICs, which is a very nice feature of this thing. So let's see. So I have my software here and I already selected 74HC or LS258. Now we're going to test it. And all the logic units inside this IC test normal, which is good. So this chip is probably good. So this one's okay. Yeah, I really highly suspect these 7708. And I'm going to end up desoldering all the MOS logic chips anyway, so I'm just going to start with these, I think. By the way, I just uploaded a collection of C64 repair tips and tricks to my website. I'm going to link that down below. 
And uh, most of the things I'm going by now are derived from those documents that I linked there. If you want to have a look, the link is in the video description and uh, you are going to find some useful documents and it's still going to be expanded over time whenever I find something useful. So as I said, I'm going to go with the 7708 chips, which are the multiplexer chips for the RAM at first. Uh, the change behavior for each power on can be a hint towards those. It might still be RAM because, yeah, as I said, the MT RAM chips are pretty prone to failure, to put it mildly. <laughs> Basically, they even fail if you have, have them just sitting in a box. They manage to do that. Adding some flux here to make things easier. And then I'm just going to go with my desoldering station and finish up with some hot air to get the chips out without stressing the board too much. There we go. Some cleaning. And it looks like we didn't lift any traces on this. Okay, that's good. Let's test the chips in the EEPROM programmer actually. Yeah, and as expected, the first one I test already shows me an error for logic unit 3. These are 257 ICs or replacements for those. Okay, let's test the other one. That one's good. Okay, so we already found the first culprit, which is the first 7708 MOS logic chip that was broken. Maybe that's all there's to it. <laughs> Let's put in some sockets and some proper 74 logic chips. So I put in some nice turned pin sockets here that I still prefer to the leaf sockets especially if you want a more permanent installation of things. I tested these. These are Texas Instruments regular 74 LS257 multiplexer chips. So these should be good. Let's see if that helped. Okay, fingers crossed that that was the fault. At least it was one of the faults. One of those clearly was faulty. Ah, out of memory error. <laughs> so here's what we get now. An out of memory error in zero, which indicates a RAM fault. I would say let's fire up the dead test card again and see if that gives us a clearer indication of which RAM chip or chips is or are faulty. <laughs> okay, that's eight flashes. Let's try that again. That's still eight flashes. I'm just doing this to rule anything out with the logic chips. Okay, it seems we get consistently eight flashes now. And usually if the mu multiplexes are good, which they are, because we just replaced them, this indicates a failure of the RAM. And that says eight flashes on a Rev B Commodore 64 that we have here is U21. This is the uh, manual for the dead test cartridge, by the way. Unfortunately, the TL866 EEPROM programmer doesn't support checking RAM chips, which would be a nice feature. But yeah, I guess nobody really uses these kinds of dynamic RAM anymore, except for in the retro community. So we are just going to desolder this. Because it's all MT RAM, I'm going to replace this at some point anyway. So let's disorder this and see if that's the culprit. Mm. 
So I'm putting a known good RAM chip in here, which is a Texas Instruments chip too. Yeah, that definitely changed the behavior of our dead test. And as you can see, we now get four flashes. Yeah, four flashes are U23. So I'm just going to replace U23. And as I said, I might as well replace all these RAM chips, but this is kind of a good way of doing it if you don't know these are uh, prone to fail. With the dead test, you usually get a pretty clear indication in case your multiplexes are working correctly. You get a pretty clear indication of which RAM chip is at fault and it's going through the RAM chips one by one. So you always have to retest and then it tells you the next one that's broken. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Might very well be there are multiple RAM chips at fault still. I'm always marking the chip I want to desolder from the back side of the board because I easily desolder the, the wrong chip otherwise. So I got another RAM chip in. Let's see what it does with the dead test now. Now it's five flashes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, those MT RAM chips, let me tell you. And five flashes means it's U10. So U10 is this chip here. One thing I learned over time with this uh, desoldering station to, is to leave the pump on for a bit after you desoldered the pin. So that prevents it from clogging up too frequently. It's still going to clog up eventually. And yeah, you know the drill. Let's try that again. Yay! And it kind of works. At least the dead test started up now. That means the RAM is basically okay. That's quite the relief already. Okay, hmm, not too bad. It has some strange discoloration. You can see it in these uh, lines here. The color RAM shows as bad, so probably we have a problem with the color RAM too. That would also explain those uh, colors. <laughs> so we should replace the color RAM next, I guess. Yeah, so this is what it looks like in normal startup without the dead test. You can see some different colors here, which is an indication that indeed our color RAM is another culprit. But other than that, this looks pretty promising already. This is our color RAM chip here. So we're going to replace that. I hope I have some of those left. I think so. Yeah, it indeed seems to mostly work fine now. I started up Jupiter Lander here, which is a nice uh, test cartridge. And as you can see, there's kind of a checkerboard pattern going on there, which would also indicate broken uh, color RAM, which is a static RAM chip, 2114. And I have plenty of those, fortunately. So I'm just going to replace that as well. <laughs> um, it might still be that that is triggered by one of the other MOS logic chips. There's still the possibility of that, obviously. But as I have many of those color RAM, static RAM chips, I'm just going to try replacing this one at first. And usually these dead test cartridge give you a good indication of what's at fault, especially if the test runs. But sometimes they are very off <laughs> because most of the chips are uh, interfaced with 
through some logic chips. So if those are at fault, you sometimes get strange readings from the test cards. Yeah, so replacing the static RAM, the color RAM, didn't do anything. So yeah, it's still displaying the same fault, the same checkerboard thing. It still shows the color RAM as bad and at the same time it shows U22, which is another RAM chip, the one that got replaced already before I worked on this. And I replaced that with another known good RAM chip and it didn't bring any changes. So. I now suspect it's the other MOS logic chips, probably. So I'm just going to replace those because both of those um, close to the color RAM somewhat interact with the color RAM. One of them offers the chip select line for the color RAM and the other one uh, interfaces it with the rest of the system, basically. So yeah, might be a fault there because the MOS chips are prone to failure. I'm just going to desolder them and test them in my EEPROM programmer. So believe it or not, both of these MOS logic chip replacements tested okay in my uh, logic tester, which is my EEPROM programmer. Put sockets in to double check afterwards, maybe replace these anyway. So what's going to be the next step? I think I want to test the VIC-2 in a working machine. And I also kind of want to test the PLA because that's such a common fault too. Maybe I'll take the character ROM out to see if that changes anything. Because that's socketed too. So yeah, we're going to see about that. There's still a lot of things that might be wonky on this one. Yeah, I put the VIC-2 from the machine we're repairing into my test board here. And it's absolutely fine. So I think we might have to desolder the PLA. I'm going to try the processor too, just for giggles, because that's socketed. I removed the PLA chip and tested it in a good test machine and it works fine. And as you can see, it still shows it as bad. It also shows a bunch of RAM chips being bad. So I assume we have to take another look at those empty RAM chips and just I'm just going to replace all of them to be sure that that's not the issue. It crashes on the color RAM test and yeah I tried this multiple times it did that every time so there's something wrong there still. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, all the RAM replaced with hopefully good one. So I replaced all the RAM and we still pretty much get the same result. And then I inspected the board a bit further and behold, you maybe can see this uh, 10 microfarad capacitor here and it's completely loose. And I think that's one of the capacitors filtering the voltages to the RAM actually. So maybe that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, one of the legs just broke off. So I'm going to replace that and have another closer inspection of the board. There seems to have been some tinkering going on here and maybe somebody broke something in the process. Yeah, this turns out to be more stubborn than I thought. Obviously, as usual. <laughs> yeah, I went on to troubleshoot this machine and didn't really find anything. I resoldered some joints. I tried to clean some traces because they seemed to be broken, but none of them were. And then I consulted Ray Carlson's troubleshooting guides again and came across his C64 IC text that is also linked in the collection of troubleshooting guides on my website. And he points out that a color issue can also be caused by one of the CD4066 chips. 
in particular the one at U16. So I got out the oscilloscope and let me show you this. So I'm probing U16, which is the one Ray Carlson says is responsible for color variances on screen. And yeah, these are pins two and three. They surely look wonky because the signal is not quite high enough, actually. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It's more like 3.7 volts. That's not quite TTL levels. The other pins actually look fine, but that might very well be the cause of our issues here. Uh, I'm just going to compare this with the working C64. So here's my test system and I'm probing the same pins on U16. And that's a much higher signal there. That's how it's supposed to look, I guess. That's more like closer to 5 volts. And the other pins look like on the one in the broken machine. So I highly suspect that chip. Yeah, this U16 might be the culprit for our color problems there and also for the diagnostics showing weird readings. I'm going to replace this <laughs> kind of an unusual fault, but yeah, we're going to see if that helps. I kind of thought this would be an easier video. <laughs> yeah, but your mileage always varies with these machines, actually. So... And yet another moment of truth kind of moment. Let's see, fingers crossed this worked. Well, hey! We got rid of the checkerboard pattern. Yay! <laughs> hey, it actually does test the color RAM now. I assume it couldn't really access the color RAM correctly, that's why it threw me a fault there. But now everything seems to be back in order. Of course it doesn't have any sound because there's no sound chip in there. Probably going to put a nano swinset in there for now. But yeah, this looks really promising. I think we found it, finally. <laughs> yeah, but this seems to work beautifully now. Okay. Yeah, now passes the uh, regular diagnostics too, which is a nice thing. Okay, to sum this up, we had one broken MOS multiplexer chip. We had the 4066 chip that was causing the weird color issues and also the bad readings for the PLA and uh, RAM in the diagnostics. We had this little capacitor with a broken off lag and we had a number of bad RAM chips. In fact, I replaced all the MT RAM chips because they are very unreliable. The other things I did were kind of red herring kind of things, but uh, I think they were reasonable, like testing the color RAM and testing the PLA in working machines was a reasonable thing to do. I think it took me some time to figure out this 4066, but I got there in the end. Yay! Yeah, I tested this for a while and put a nano swinset in there for some rudimentary sound. It doesn't sound as good as a real SID chip, but yeah, this works fine. Uh, despite the fact I suck at Nebulous. <laughs> but this is one of the more demanding games I could try. I thought I'd give it a shot. And it works beautifully. Yeah, uh, I think that's it for today. Managed to fix another C64 that turned out to be more of a challenge than I anticipated. Considering the fact that this was only meant to be kind of a stand-in video, I spent I don't know how many hours on this. It's already getting dark outside, so yeah. I hope you enjoyed this, hope you stay tuned for more. Thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon and on the channel memberships page. I'm Jan Beta, thanks for watching, see you next time, bye!